Hello, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the Blind Slim world. This is Viper Strike 95. And great to have you guys here. I hope you guys have had a great uh, week. This is the start of the weekend, everyone. Happy Friday to you guys. And yes, we are back with our around the world trip. This is day number six. We're going to be finishing up Cuba today. We're going to be checking out to the other side of the island to the east. I hope everyone's doing all right. So it's great to see you guys again. And I hope you guys are going to have a great time with the stream. We'll be learning about the rest of Cuba today, as well as flying over quite a few of the other cities. So happy to be here. And we have quite a few people in the chat already with King Cobra and Super Typhon. Excellent seeing you both um, here today. Let me, let's me let give a shout out for King Cobra. He does stream here on Twitch. Um, definitely a great friend in the community, a longtime friend. Yes, we're in Cuba, my, my friend. We're finishing up Cuba, which is a pretty cool country. Too bad, um, but next week is going to be the um, Caribbean World Update. So maybe next Wednesday... Depending on what day the Caribbean and World Update is going to come out, I might do um, a Caribbean stream next Wednesday. And maybe we'll do some flight out of Sangster International. Probably do some flights in Sangster. Maybe to Cuba. Hmm. And then and then probably fly from Cuba over to um, somewhere in the Bahamas. So let's go over the flight uh, plan for today's stream. So, flight plan wise, we're going to go ahead. No, not the slideshow. This. Make her nice and big. Nice and big. So, the flight plan today, um, we're going to start here at, um, at Keo Coco. From Keo Coco, we'll head south, uh, southeast. We'll make our way over to Camagüe, um, which is actually Cuba's third largest city. And make our first stop here at Mike Uniform Charlie Mike, uh, Ignacio Agramont International. Then from here we'll have a. Then we'll fly all the way from here to Cuba's fourth largest city, in Holguin, and make a and then make a landing here at Frank Pies Airport, Mike Uniform Hotel Golf. And finally, um, this will be the longest leg of the trip. But we'll fly from Holguin and make our way over to the Eastern Mountain Range. We'll be flying through quite a, up some beautiful peaks here in Cuba. Fly some through some of the national parks and make our way over to our final stop at Baracoa, where Christopher Columbus um, actually visited here in Cuba. This was the place he landed. And we'll make our final stop here at Mike Uniform Bravo Alpha. Yes, yeah, should be a beautiful, and I mean beautiful flight. It should be a great trip. Now, of course, if you guys want to join in, we're on the Southeast Asian server. And take a plane that will go at least 150 to 160 knots. Uh, at least take something at least 150. So the plane we're taking here today, the good old Beechcraft Bonanza. I haven't flown this thing in a long, long time. But for guys that don't know about the Bonanza, this is the Model 36 Bonanza, the newest updated model. And the G36 is the glass cockpit version of it. But the Bonanza's had a very long history since the 1940s. Over 17,000 have been built in both its original V-tail and conventional tail versions. This was a very popular aircraft, but gained a reputation as a, the V-tail Bonanza was a doctor killer due to a lot of the overconfident wealth of pilots, accidents, and flight breakups. But despite all that, though, uh, the Bonanza is a very, very popular aircraft for general aviation purposes. And it's even operated by both civilian and mil even military operations. Use the Bonanza uh, as a training plane. Very popular plane. Uh, very successful, though there have been notable uh, flights, including the Fort Bonanza to fly from Hawaii to the continental United States, being the first light airplane. It set several flight records. There was even an around the world trip uh, by Pierre Mack. He did an around the world trip. And this one also had a lot of accidents. And some of the most notable accidents included 
One on February 3rd, 1959, when the rock stars Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and Big Bopper were all killed, were all, all died after takeoff, and it became the night day known as the day that music died. Um, Steve Wozniak actually had a had crash his bonanza. Thankfully, though, he made a full recovery. And of course, um, in 1982, uh, Randy Rhodes was actually killed in an accident on March 19th, 1982. So, but the G36 can go up to around 176 uh, knot cruise speed, has a range of 760 nautical miles, and a range of 930 nautical miles with ferry range. It can climb to a ceiling of 18,000 feet. Making this all around a really, really good all around general aviation plane. Perfect for the flights we're going to be doing here today. Let's go ahead and get into our cockpit and we'll go ahead. Uh, this is the Asobo version, not the Black Square version. Yeah, they all died in the aircraft. Yep. Uh, Steve Wadnack didn't die. He made a full recovery, but. Probably Holly, Randy Rhodes, and uh, some of the others didn't make it. Go ahead and turn on the Bonanza. But yeah. Should be an easy startup. If you guys want to join along with us, um, we're on the Southeast Asia server. Um, recommended. Um, take any plane that can take 150, 60 knots. Any plane that can do that, or or even above, that's fine. Just don't take anything underneath. We're gonna be. I think we're gonna cruise around 155 knots for this one. So we're going to go ahead, um, the cruise altitude for the first leg of the trip, um, which is going to be around 60, is going to be around uh, 70 miles, we're going to go up to cruise altitude of 4,000 feet. We're going to go 4,000. Even though the ground is 1,500, I want to gain some extra altitude for this one. We're going to go ahead and make our way to the end of the runway. Let's go ahead and take off. Hey, Sleazy does again. Good to see you, Sleazy. Uh, check his channel here on Twitch. Sleazy does a lot of flights with general aviation and sometimes with the airliners. So yeah, we're here back in Cuba. We're going to go ahead and take off. 
and we're gonna make our flight here. Climb up for quite a bit. Kira, I hope you didn't drink the water. Uh, no, I'm not drinking the water in Cuba. Uh, thank you very much. I heard the water tastes like chicken. <laughs> yeah, uh, I heard about that. <laughs> Very funny. I hope you guys are doing well. So yeah, the weekend has finally came around. Um, so I guess we got really cool plans for the weekend. Uh, for me at least, um, uh, my weekend is going to be mainly just doing more Firefly Air Flights. Do more, try to catch up with Sean, hopefully, for Sean Dale, and hopefully keep up with him. I'm also going to help melt my dad with the basement on Sunday after my stream. Got. Him. We gotta move some stuff back into the family room. So that's gonna be my weekend, basically. He's gonna be doing some housework. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about my slideshow. So we'll be talking about a little bit about Cuba's culture today. So Cuba's culture is what we're going to be talking about mainly on our stream today. I saved it for this part of the stream. So Cuba is culturally is influenced by its melting pot of cultures between those of Spain, Africa, the original Tainos as well, who created much of modern Cuba's culture. Um, in 19, after the 1959 revolution, the government started its own literacy program, offered free education, and established sports, ballet, and music programs. But there's a lot of different um, parts that make Cuba's culture that make it pretty unique. Um, the first one thing we got to talk about is its architecture. Um, architecture in Cuba was mainly manifested during the colonial period. It brought the culture of Spain with its Baroque influence. The first villas and settlements were constructed situated by church surrounded by several houses and those houses had an interior central courtyard and covered in grills and they were and there were also magnificent religious buildings including the basilica de san francisco in havana as well as large forts built for defense built for tending the attacks of pirates and buccaneers 
There are also several historic old centers in Cuba that were built during the Spanish colonial period, including those with UNESCO heritage sites of Havana, Camagüey, San Fuegos, and Trinidad, which offer great architectural bastions of all currents and trends, from Baroque, Neoclassical, to eclectic art, and other uh, preserved colonial towns like Santiago de Cuba. Um, during the Republican era after the Spanish left, large buildings were built such as the Capitol Mall in Washington, as well as the Foxa, and, and later the Havana Libre, for some of the most um, well-known for modern stuff. Then after the Soviet Revolution happened, architecture in Cuba then received a strong Soviet influence with its desire for symmetry and space saving, and entire new neighborhoods were even built in the style of those in Moscow, Moscow or Minsk. After when the Berlin Wall fell, architecture received more diverse currents, and there's a lot of plaster hotels with modern glass and steel facades. So that definitely is an important part of Cuban architecture. That'd be pretty cool. Oh, come on. Hey, Biggles, good to see you. Um, yes, we are indeed in Southeast Asia server, my dude. Yeah, we're cruising on 169 knots. Okay, this is going to get a little quicker than I was expecting to, but I mean, this is fine. Uh, okay, there's Maz Dito Lee. Uh, I see him. He's in the F-22. I don't have the F-22. Good, yeah, good to see you too, my dude. Welcome in. Um, yeah, so um, on my Discord, um, I here's the link to my Discord if you guys are so interested and keen on joining in. Um, my Discord, I did post some new information for the All Countries Around the World Tour. So I decided to do the next seven days of the tour. On uh, days 8 through 14, I just posted them on the Discord yesterday, last night. So day 8, we'll be going from Kingston. We're going to be into Haiti. Um, we'll be turning around the entire country of Haiti on day 8. Which is, we're going to take, I believe we're going to take the DC-3 out for the first time since the World Tour. Uh, for the DC-3 around the World Flight. We'll go from Kingston to Cap Haitian. We'll be taking also a brief look at uh, Les Cays, um, and of course the capital city of Port-au-Prince. Before making our way over to Cap Haitian, day nine we'll be back to Cap, Cap Haitian. We'll be going over um, to first to Port of Plata, then we'll fly over Santiago de los Cal Calveros. Go visit the highest peak in the Caribbean at Pico Duarte, make it our way to Constant Constanza, and then make our way over to Santo Domingo, the capital and one of the oldest uh, settlement European settlements in the New World, in Santo Domingo. Then day nine, then day ten, we'll be um, we'll be doing it. We'll be doing a flight with the um, ETR. Again, we'll be doing some airliner stuff once again. Uh, we might bring the 737 for this one. Um, we'll make our way over from Santo Domingo. Um, over first to San Juan, Puerto Rico, which I've been in here in real life. Uh, Tango Juliet, Sierra Juliet. And then, then from there, we'll make one more flight. We'll be flying over from San Juan over to the next new sovereign country, and that is St. Kitts. And we'll fly, over, we'll fly over to Bradshaw International in Basquiatari. Then, then from there, on day 11 of our trip, we'll be back at Bradshaw. We'll, we'll circle around both the islands of St. Kitts and Nevis. Then we'll visit Codrington, uh, which is located in the island of Barbuda. And then we'll make our way to Antigua uh, and make our way over to BC Bird. That will be day 11. Day 12, we'll make our way over from Antigua. We'll be flying over Guadalupe and make our first landing in Dominica. After checking on Dominica, we'll fly over Martinique and make our landing here at Castries in St. Lucia. 
That'll be day 12. Day 13, we'll check out um, the rest of St. Lucia, Barbados, and St. Vincent. Day, and then day thir and then finally day 14, we'll be finishing up St. Vincent, Granada, and Trinidad and Tobago. And that'll be day 14, and that will be the next seven days. We'll be checking out a lot of new places. So we have King Cobra, we have Biggles and Mosques. Um, we have Lazi Dali, King Cobra, and Biggles with us. Great to have you guys in here with us today. Del Dude, good to see you, my dude. Welcome on in. And Super Tom, good to see you guys here too. Great having the guys, great having the lads here. For sure. Yeah, I haven't flown the Bonanza in a while. It'd be pretty nice to fly this thing again. It's. I think it's been a couple months since I last flown it. Um, yeah, we're 40 nautical miles out of uh, Kamigwe, so we're about pretty close uh, to there. Yeah, um, I do have some MSFS news. Um, Bluebird Simulations updated their 757-767. They highlighted the challenges, te technical advances of the 75. Um, they added updates to their virtual cockpit. Do sound sound from Boris. And much much more development they're also going to work on the xbox and pc um and they said it's going to come out around uh for 20 from fs uh they said it's going to release for 2020 edition but here's something that's really exciting they they revealed that in for that they're going to give it a free upgrade for this for 2024 which is going to be awesome so i'm very very excited for the sun five um they I like how transparent they are. I know they work very, very hard. And now they're aiming this 7.5 to not be a mid-level plane anymore. This is going to be a high-fidelity airliner now. This could go up with Phoenix or PMDG. And if that's the case, it ends up being as good as those two. Oh my gosh, I would be a super happy person. That 7.5 is making me even more excited. I can't wait to show it off to you guys. Because if I'm going to do... I may have to do several streams with it in a row. Just because I want to fly it. Oh man, this thing's gonna be my most anticipated plane. Oh yeah, that's right, you're Super Tom. Yes, I know it's you in the sim. Sorry. Oh, that's right, that's Super Tom. It took me a bit, I'm sorry. <laughs> like I said, I'm very, very sorry sometimes. It takes me a bit. So. Hey, Filthy, good to see you. Happy Friday to you, my dude. Uh, good to see you, Filthy. Um, we're, in, we're back in Cuba for our around-the-world trip. Um, we're back in Cuba. We're going to make our way over for... Um, we just started from Coco Teo. Teo Coco, and we'll make our way down surf to uh, Camagüe first. Um, we're about... I believe we're just about 30 nautical miles from the city. So I'm going to go ahead and talk a bit about the sea we're going to be checking out first. Uh, this is Kamagwe. Um, this city here is actually um, Cuba's third largest city with about 321,000 inhabitants. It was founded as Santa Maria del Porto del Principe 
in 1514 by Spanish colonists of the northern coasts and moved inland in 1528 to, to a site of a Taino uh, village that was actually in the same name. It was one of the seven original settlements uh, found in Cuba by the Spanish. This city's unique old town is actually designed as a mage, and that maze, and that was because um, Henry Morgan burned the city in the 17th century, so the city itself was redesigned as as a maze, so attackers would have to find a hard to move around the city. The symbol of the city is the clay pot, used to capture rainwater and keep it fresh. The city itself was also the birthplace of Cuban revolutionary Ignacio Agramont, an important figure of the tenured war against Spain to help Cuba fight for independence against Spain. In July 2008, the old town was now a designated UNESCO World Heritage Site due to its unique uh, city planning, prominent role in Spanish colonization agriculture, and its rich architecture with its various influences. And, and it's definitely a very diverse place here to visit here in Cuba. Yeah, one of the big things about this city is culture is the clay pot. Um, clay pots are everywhere. You see clay pot all over the city. Small, small, small hand, some large enough for two people to stand up in. Ears, monuments are for real use. One of the local legends say if you drink the water from one of these clay pots, you will stay in the city. Um. And these clay jars don't just store a lot of water, they also store wine, oil, and grain uh, as a solution to the city's water shortage. So it's become a very big symbol is the clay pot. There's also lots of places to visit here in the city, including the Church of Nuestra in Señor del Carmen, which was completed in 1825. The Cathedral of Comgue dates back to 1530 when it began as a chapel. It was completed in 1864. Um, and there's also the Grand Hotel Cagway in 1938. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of notable residents of the city. A uh, professional boxer Luis Ortiz was born here. It was his birthplace. Um, there's a couple of artists and poets like Jose Iroa, Brigana Aguero y Aguero, and the poet of the of the revolution, Raul Rivera. This city is also home to several athletes, including um, uh, baseball Hall of Famer Tony Perez. Uh, his real name is Antonio Perez Regal. He is now in the Pro Baseball Hall of Fame himself as well as the birthplace of the national poet of Cuba, Nicholas Guillen, and physicist and scientist, Carl J. Finlay. So yeah, th this place is home to quite a few famous people. About comic way. Um, and of course, the airport of the city is uh, Ignacio Agramont International. Of course, named after the, um, of course, it's named after the famous revolutionary city. Uh, but this international airport serves the city and, of course, the resort village of Santa Lucia, uh, Santa Lucia, which is a very well-known uh, resort town. Um, this airport was actually used by the U.S. Air Force during World War II. Uh, for the 6th Air Force, and they did a lot of B-18 Bolo bombers from the base. And they also use it um, as a postal office for the post, for postal stuff. Currently, it serves a lot of international flights to places like Miami, uh, Georgetown, Guiana, Minuaga, um Nicaragua, Paramibo, seasonal char flight to Moscow, Port-au-Prince, Cancun, and Meridia. Are some of the desk are the destinations that are flown out of Mike Unicorn Charlie Mike. Oh, yeah, that is um the destinations.
definitely a pretty important place to check out for sure. Gonna go ahead and descend uh, down to. We're gonna go ahead and descend down to. Um, two thousand feet. We're gonna go check out the city and make our first landing of the day. So, um, one place that we're not visiting today on this trip is the city of Santiago de Cuba. That's actually Cuba's second largest city, actually. Unfortunately, we're not visiting here on this tour. But, but, Santiago, but we might actually do a flight to Santiago, maybe when the Caribbean World Update goes next Wednesday. If that's the case, I want to do some flying from Sangster. Maybe, uh, maybe from Sangster over to Scarborough in Trinidad. That might be where I want to do it. In the 7-3, of course. Fly from Sangster to, to there would be pretty cool. As well. But yeah, I really hope that when we get, when Firefly Air gets to go to um, the Caribbean someday... Um, I'm hoping that they do Sangster as a hub because um, that's going to be one of the new handcrafted airports. And I've been to Montego Bay. Um, Jamaica, naturally scenic wise, is absolutely beautiful. A great place to do some land in the sim. excited for it. And yeah, do just click the link if you're interested in joining our virtual airline. Uh, check out Firefly Air. It's completely free on FS Hub. And you guys are more than welcome to join the virtual airline. Yeah, this is the city of Comicway. Yeah, guys, um, I, I hope you guys like it, um, what I did for the Discord. Um, post, I think I, I, I try to keep it up to date for every seven days. So for those seven days, um, now 
Now, on the all tour schedule, well, it turns out um, day 14 is actually all the way in March 8th, whereas day 13 is February 18th, and that's because um, the next week after that, well, I'm going to be heading out to Long, to Long Beach, actually, because, well, I have a seven-day trip into Western Mexico I have to go to with, with, with the family, so... So I'm going to be heading out for, for a seven-day trip, uh, seven-day cruise into Mexico. Which is, I mean, we've been really needing a trip like this since we have all that moving stuff to do. It sound, and, and with the weather, it definitely sounds good right now. Here's our first stop. Welcome to Mike Uniform, Charlie Mike. Also today, uh, we got two-tone Murphy, uh, as per other content today, um, we got two-tone Murphy stream later today on two-tone Murphy's channel. Um, he, he's currently doing an ATR flight from Pittsburgh to Cleveland to Detroit. Uh, should be a good one, um, honestly. Pittsburgh is our eastern United States hub. Um... Which is going to be nice. I really like our East United States hub. I really do. I love Pittsburgh. Great, great airport. Hopefully with Aero Economy, if Aero Economy comes out, I think the main hubs I would definitely like to fly would be Pittsburgh. Hoping, also the West United States hub mainly, but I'm hoping it will be, I hope Merck can agree on moving into Reno. Just because I can fly the airliners a little easier in Reno compared to Tahoe. And probably... Either the hub at Zurich or the hub in Chubu. Well, London. But definitely the two US hubs are going to be where I want to fly the most. Um. So. We're going to stop here for just a second. We're going to stop right here for just a second. So if you guys want to join on in, we're going to just briefly stop here for just a second. Um, If you got anyone else want to join on in, um, you, we are in Southeast Asia. We're Mike Uniform, Charlie Mike. And we're here uh, in the Southeast Asia server. So we're going to stop here for just a second or two. Just see if anyone wants to join on in. There's Super Tom. Land the F-22. Nice. So let's go ahead and uh, get back to the cockpit. Um, let's go ahead and get to our next leg. Um, for this one, um, our cruise altitude is going to be. I guess we can do two thousand feet for this next one. Actually, we're going to go back to 4,000. Just to be able to see.
So for this one, our next leg is going to be around um, not 101 nautical miles. So the next leg is going to be a 101 nautical mile leg. Um, so once we climb, we're going to go ahead and talk about the next thing about Cuba. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the next thing about Cuban culture. Um, and that is going to be Cuban cuisine. Here it is. Um, Cuba's cuisine is mainly usually between Spanish and Caribbean cuisines and often share recipes with Spanish cooking but also with influences from Taino, African, and other Caribbean cuisines. Um, this, as a result, it has a blend of several influences. Um, as a result, and many of uh, Spanish cuisines brought here to Cuba. Cuba's cuisines mainly got a lot of seafood stuff uh, and it's tropical climate. Uh, for most Cubans, the traditional Cuban meal here served in Cuba is rice and beans. They, they can be cooked together or even apart. When cooked together, um, the recipe is called a congri or moros, or moros y cristanos, black beans and rice. If cooked separately, it's called arroz con frioles, rice with beans, or arroz y frioles, rice and beans. And to produce the rice and beans, um. Onions, garlic, and black pepper are always often used as a uh, sofrito. Then the sofrito is added with white rice and pre-boiled black beans, as well as the lard that the beans are boiled in. Uh, and that's what makes the traditional uh, uh, rice and beans. Another really popular dish is the Cuban sandwich or mixto. Um, very popular uh, lunch item that grew out of the once open flow between uh, Cuba and Florida workers, mainly from Key West in the Ybor City neighborhood of Tampa. And basically, this Cuban sandwich is built on a base of lightly buttered Cuban bread, which is similar to uh, French and Italian bread. It contains slices of roasted pork, thinly sliced serrano ham, Swiss cheese, dill pickle, and yellow mustard. In Tampa, Genoa salami is layered in with the other meats because of a lot of the Italian immigrants. Um, after assembly, it may be pressed into a grooveless grill called a plancha, but you can eat it without it. Um, but there's a lot of other dishes here from Cuba that are definitely worth trying for sure. Um, for example, you could um, put arroz con liche, which is rice pudding. You have ropa beja, which is shredded uh, flank steak and tomato-based sauce. 
Um, it's one of the national dishes in Cuba. There's boliche, which is pot roast dish with uh, stuffed with ham. And of course, um, they also have um, they also have the lichon, which is suckling pig, and camarones, which is shrimp. They also have a few Cuban drinks too, including um, the batido, um, which is a kind of um, handmade milkshake with milk fruit and ice, coming in flavors such as um, guanabana and wheat flavored milkshake. There's also Cuba Libre, which is basically a cocktail with rum, Coca-Cola, sugar, and lime. And they also make a mojito, which is a Cuban punch of mojito with rum, mint, sugar, lime, and club soda. But yeah, there's quite a few cocktails too. So Cuban cuisine definitely has a lot of variants on that. So yeah, I want to ask you guys, uh, we've got any really cool stuff this weekend, um, like always. So uh, in terms of other news, and I do want to talk about that. Um, the NFL is going to be starting on Sunday. So I'll talk more about that on Sunday. But yeah, the AFC and NFC Championship games um, are going to be played. So it should be exciting. I'll talk more about that then. Um, for Baseball Hall of Fame stuff, this is really important because, well, um, that's because, well, the 2025 Hall of Fame ballot um, has finally announced some of the first-time players for the 2025 eligible stuff for this year. But there are two big names that I think could definitely make the Hall of Fame in 2025. And there's quite a few people on the eligibles, but some of the most notable um, but some of the most notable names for the 2025 class include uh, six-time All-Star and signing award winner uh, Felix Hernandez. Um, we also have six-time All-Star and American Cy Young winner CC Sabathia. And of course, the player that I think is definitely going to make it first ballot is going to be Ichiro Suzuki, who was a 10-time All-Star. He won the Rookie of the Year and MVP back in 2001, played 19 seasons, and, and has had over 300 hits, uh, over 3,000 hits, plus his 1,270 hits uh, during his nine seasons in Japan making him the all-time leading hits leader in professional baseball. He's also um, he's also tied the MLB record with 10 with 200 plus hits in 10 straight seasons, including the 262 hit season in 2004, along with being a 10-time Gold Glover as well. I mean, and with a 311 bat, Ichiro is definitively going to be in the Hall of Fame first ballot. No question, Ichiro deserves to be in the first ballot. 
I wonder if he's going to be a unanimous Hall of Famer. I think he might be unanimous. I mean, people forget he, start, he started his MLB career at age 27 after spending his first nine seasons. Just imagine if we got Prime Ichiro, but years earlier. I mean, he would be ridiculous. No question, Hall of Famer. The other one I think could be in the Hall of Fame would be CC Zabafia. I think he would also be in the Hall of Fame. 3,000 strikeouts. Cy Young Award winner. He's been in the top five at the ballot four times. One, 250 games. One, um, And he's one of only five pitchers with that. Which Yeah, Zabafia is also in the Hall of Fame next year. I think, I think, I think Ichiro and Zabafia are going to be the two Hall first time, uh, eligibility guys in the Hall of Fame. Felix might make it in the future. Um, me, me, I mean, yeah, he's had inconsistency, but man, each, I mean, see, Felix was just really great. It was just that each year, it was just Felix could, it's a hard time getting a lot of wins. So, that was the 25 uh, Hall of Fame. So, but yeah, I hope an intro makes it next year. I, each year is one of my favorite players growing up. Hey, good to see you, Kingsman and Dougal. Good to have you both here. I hope you're doing well. No worries, uh, Dougal, with the dinner. I hope you enjoy. But yeah, we're here in the Beechcraft Bonanza today. Um, we got a few bit of people with us. We have King Cobra, Super Tom. I know Biggles is about further out uh, for where we are right now. We just talked a bit about Cuba's cuisine. Um, it's, it's definitely with its staple with um, the good old meat and beans are a big part of the cuisine here um but you guys you guys should stick around to the end of the flight guys because um the last leg of the trip should be very pretty um national parks everywhere much and oh yeah here's biggles over there here's biggles he's far ahead I'm really excited for the Baseball Hall of Fame next uh, for next year. I think that'd be pretty good. And then there's the 26 eligibles, which include uh, the 2026 class may not be so good. I mean, the closest thing I think of a Hall of Famer from the 2006 eligible class right now would probably be Cole Hamels. Um, would be Cole. Um, would be Cole Hamels. I mean, he would be the closest thing to a Hall of Famer. I mean, would, but I mean, the 2006 class, the 25 class is each year which would be no question. And speaking about Hall of Fame, um, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, um, um, the 2024 uh, class, the the monitor players are going to be the finals, and they just announced that um, as well. The 15 monitor finalists, um. The notable Hall of Famers that are going to be in Canton, Ohio for American football include Jared Allen, um, Dwight Greeny, Antonio Gates, Corey Holt, Andre Johnson, Julius Peppers, Reggie Wayne, and Patrick Willis. And that's at least some of the players. So, uh, who do I think is going to be in the Hall of Fame? Oh boy, they're going to the rising class of our nine players. Oh boy, um, they're also going to include, um, they're also going to do the senior ones with Steve McMichael, Randy Brandishar, Al Powell, and Buddy Parker. Oh boy. So who do I think is going to be the Hall of Fame for the pro football stuff? I think Joyce Peppers is definitely going to be on that list. Peppers has been, absolutely been amazing for many years. Joyce Peppers has been a great pick. I also think Antonio Gates, I mean, played for his entire career as a charger. It has been, I mean, he was undrafted, and he's put up Hall of Fame numbers. Definitely put Gates in. Then I think some of the other ones, um,
Um, I think that was the two. I think my other three, I'm thinking Dwight Breeny makes the Hall of Fame. Um, is going to be Dwight Breeny. I think Breeny makes the Hall of Fame. Um, I, I think it'd be a tough one, but Patrick Willis could. Uh, I know he's had a lot of injuries, but I think he makes it. And then the last one, uh, maybe Lily Anderson? Maybe him. Uh, he was part of the Bengals. Willie Anderson? But I, actually, not Willie Anderson. I think I think it either is going to be either Reggie, is either going to be Reggie Wayne or Tory Holt. I know there's a lot of receiver backlog. Maybe Andre Johnson makes the Hall of Fame, becomes the first Texan to make the Hall of Fame. Maybe Andre Johnson. Uh, going to be tough. See which ones are going to get picked. Yeah, the Hall of Fame should be interesting, and um, they'll be announcing their selections on. Oh yeah, it will be February eighth where it gets revealed. So it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be about two weeks. Oh, so we'll be see. But yeah, should be interesting to see who gets picked in the Hall of Fame. But yeah, I think if Facebook Football Hall of Fame is going to probably be Julius Peppers, Antonio Gates. Um, then this is, the rest of it is not easy, but I think it's going to be Dwight Freeney. Um, Corey Holt would be really good. And then, then I believe Patrick Willis. I mean, the dude's a monster. He didn't play for too long, but man... Hey, good to see you, my dude, Cowboy Cody. Good to see you. Uh, hope you're doing well, Cowboy Cody. We're about to make our way over to Holguin. So let's talk a little bit about Cuban literature for just a short um, bit before we reach our next destination. Let's talk about Cuban literature for a bit. So, Cuban literature has found its voice in the early 19th century with the themes of independence and freedom by Jose Marti. And you have national writers like Nicholas Guillen, Jose Z. Talat on social protests, while the poetry and novels of Dulce Maria Lones and Jose Lanza and Lima have been influential in Cuban literature. Then there's also magic realism movement that was pioneered by Alejo Carpenter and other writers uh, have gained uh, international recognition in the post-revolutionary era. However, many of them continue to work in exile due to the ideological control media by Cuban authorities, though some writers still live here in Cuba. So, there's that. And then Cuba's music is very rich tradition. Cuba has a very rich musical tradition. Uh, it's a major part of its culture. And the central form of this music is the is Sun, Sun Cubano which emerged from the 19th century, which bases of many other styles in Cuban music, like the uh, danzon, mambo, cha-cha-cha, and salsa music are all big parts of uh, Cuban music. And popular Cuban music styles of all styles have been enjoyed around the world. Cuban classical music, which includes African and European influences, have received international acclaim by composers like Ernesto Lacona, Uh, recognized Cuban artists include Los Van Van Orchestra, known as the Music Machinery in Cuba, pianist Chuchino Valdez, and Frank Fernandez are some of the most well-known Cuban artists. So, and of course, dance is also a pretty big deal here too. Dance is very popular here. Uh, dance on is the official music genre in dance in Cuba. Mambo music dance developed originally in Cuba with further developments in Mexico and the United States. 
In fact, salsa dancing actually originated here in Cuba as the salsa. And it's danced all across the world, too. So, pretty cool stuff. Um. Beautiful time here. Um, oh yeah, I forgot one more thing in the community. Um, on Saturday, Allison Johnson's gonna be back in the sim once again. Allison's doing another leg of her Sheila Scott tour. She's gonna make her way over from Sydney to Auckland. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's gonna be about a seven hour flight. It's gonna be across the entire Tasman Sea. Um, from Sydney to Auckland. Now, normally, this wouldn't be a big deal if it wasn't the airliners. You'd, you'd be there pretty quickly. In fact, according to... Um, um, according to um, flight radar, I'm trying to look for okay, New Zealand, uh, Sydney, Auckland. In an airliner, it'll take about two hours and thirty-six minutes to cross the Tasman Sea from Sydney over to Auckland in an airliner. crazy stuff uh, for sure so definitely check out Allison's channel uh, when she comes around All right. I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna go ahead and descend back to 2,000 feet once again and we're gonna make our way over to 2,000 
yeah, I hope you guys are enjoying the stream. If you guys are liking the stream and you guys haven't, uh, haven't followed the channel and you like what you see here, smash that follow button and support the channel. I would like to continue to get this channel the support it needs. So I do appreciate um, that as well. We're about 20 nautical miles out of um, our next city destination. We're going to be checking out the city of Holguin. Um, will be our next destination is Holguin. Holguin is a city municipality in Cuba. It's actually the fourth largest city in the country after Havana, Santiago de Cuba, and Camagüey. Um, before Columbus, the people settled in Hunts made a royal palm in this area. Um, but this part became Spanish um, when it was founded in 1523 on land donated to Diego Velazquez de Estelar to Captain Garcia, Francisco Garcia Hogan, Spanish officer, and he added his surname to the town, making it San Isidoro de Hogan. Um, before Pope Francis visited the United States in 2015, he visited Cuba, and one of his stops was um, to the Diocese of Hogan, commemorate the uh, location that Christopher Columbus landed back in 1492. Uh, the city economically is well known for its brewery, uh, Cerveceria Bucanero, based here in the city, making three different kinds of beer. There's also two small hotels focused on health tourism close to the airport. In fact, Diego Maradona was even treated in this area for a substance addiction as well as established city hotels and boutique hotels in the city as well. The notable people from the city um, include Cuban composer and musician Faustino Oramas, ML manager and coach Freddy Gonzalez, Pulitzer Prize winning author uh, Oscar Huedos, who was raised in, and before he immigrated to the United States, and Major League Baseball player Aroldis Chapman are some notable people from the city. And the main airport uh, serving this area is Mike Uniform Hotel Golf, Frank Pies Airport. Um, it bears the name of Cuban revolutionary Frank Pies, uh, who, who helped overthrow Batista's government in Cuba. It was originally built in 1960 for military purposes, but it became a civilian hub in 1966. 
It consists of both a domestic and international terminal, which was built in 1996 and expanded to 2007. Um, some of the destinations here include um, Havana, Montego Bay, Montreal, Toronto, Quebec, Miami, Managua, Frankfurt, Milan, Montreal, Toronto, Port-au-Prince, and Cancun are some of the destinations. However, for military purposes, this was um, one of the most important air bases in the country during the Cold War times, was in barracks and fire aircraft. So do keep that in mind for this airport. But yeah, we're getting to now the more scenic parts of the country. Um, you can definitely see the changing landscapes. You see hills all over the place now. A beautiful area though. Absolutely stunning. Um great, great. There's the city of Hold Glen. There's Hogwin. Here's King Cobra. All right, so here's Hogwin. Here's like downtown and all that.
Well, guys, um, we're going to land here pretty shortly. Um, and once there, I'm going to take a quick break and we'll be right back at Mike Uniform Hotel Golf. We'll be doing the last of the trip from here to Barracoa. And we'll be finishing up the rest of the slides for the, for the stream. So... Let's go ahead and make the landing. All right, guys, um, I'll be taking a quick break. We'll be right back.
All right, guys, we're back. So, um, so we got one last leg left to go, guys. We're gonna make our way over to Barcoa today. This will be the final leg of the trip. Um, here at Barcoa. So for this one, we're going to be climbing to 5,000 feet. So, oh, we got one last flight. Yeah, we're going to get to some of the really beautiful areas of Cuba. So before we get going, uh, let me go ahead and pull up the last slides we need for uh, the stream. Let's go ahead and pull up some of the last ones. So in terms of sports, um, Cuba has a lot of traditions that are popular with other North American sports. Of course, their most popular is baseball. Um, Baseball is the most popular, but other sports Cuba has done well include boxing, athletics, volleyball, wrestling, and more. Cuba is the dominant force in amateur boxing, and achieving high medal tallies in international competitions. Cuba also has a rich history with baseball. Um, it's actually the most popular sport in Cuba, and it's been it's been around since the 1870s, brought by a lot of the Americans. Uh, brought by a lot of Cuban students returned from U.S. colleges and American sailors. And Cuba, and the U.S. has a lot of effects on Cuba athletes. Um, and Cuba has had a very rich um, baseball history. And, I mean, there have been many players that defected from Cuba to play in the Major League Baseball. Including players like Jose Abreu, Jordan Alvarez, Oroz Chapman, Jonas Cespedes, Idols Garcia for the Rangers, Levon Hernandez, Yes, the Puig and more. A lot of them were defected from Cuba. Cuba definitely has a rich sporting tradition. Um, and finally, let's talk about some Cuba fun facts um, for Cuba. 
Um, Cuba included some of the world's finest cigars, and they held cigar festivals like the Fiesta de Habano are held here in Cuba every year. Cubans love to dance. It's famous for salsa dancing, but also other dance styles like rumba, mambo, and cha-cha. And finally, Pico Chiquino is the highest mountain in Cuba in Grand, Na Par Grand Park National Sierra Mastra at uh, 6,469 feet. Um, are some of the fun fun facts about Cuba. And then some of the um, famous landmarks in Cuba that are not in Havana include the Trinidad and the Valley of Los Ingenios, found in the 16th century due to a lot of its sugar mills, and the San Pedro de la Roca Fortress in Santiago de Cuba. Constructed in the 16th century and known for its gorgeous views. So yeah. That's it. That's going to be the last slides about Cuba. We still got two more slides to talk about Barracoa and its airport. So, yeah, we're now going to get into some of the, the most naturally beautiful areas in the entire country. So there are a couple of national parks here in Cuba. I hope you guys are enjoying this. We have quite a few people. We have King Cobra here. King Cobra's with us. Good to see you, my dude. But yeah, we're now getting to the really pretty areas of Cuba. Right up here. Okay, you're gonna see a Mongo. No worries. Um, uh, no worries at all, Brian. For errands, thank you so much, Mongo, for working and, and watching the stream. And hope you were, hope you have a safe time getting those errands done, Mongo. Um, take care, my dude. 
and see and have a good weekend. Hopefully, I'll see you on Sunday. So one of the national parks we'll be visiting is Sierra Crystal National Park. I know I put the notes on it, but it is actually Cuba's first national park in fact, created in 1930. It's located in the heights of the Sierra Crystal Mountains, one of the highest ranges in Cuba that's second only to the Sierra Maestra in, in southeast Cuba. Um, Crystal Peak, which is the tallest peak here, um, reaches an elevation of 4,300 feet. And you can find uh, Cuban pine trees as well as the Cuban Solodon uh, shrew. Absolutely gorgeous scenery. Look at this. That's nice. That's pretty. Again, like, how many people would think, oh, Cuba would have natural scenery? But, but yeah, Cuba's nice. This part of Cuba is nice to find. Like, some of the satellite in here is actually good, which is pretty, not what I expected.
beautiful scenery here today. The scenery. Wow, this scenery is nice. Beautiful scenery here today, here in this part of Cuba. This is pretty. The scenery, amazing. Hey, Blockstar, good to see you, Blocks. Um, pop in and say hello. Oh, great to see you. You'll be the match of the year today. Oh, yes, the match of the year is going to be on tonight. Oh, awesome. Match of the year. That's, that, that, that's an awesome show. If you guys don't know about matches of the year, it talks about the 100th bomb group. And I know of a certain streamer uh, whose family was actually a part of the... Um, the crew. Yes, I'm talking about uh, Splotcher 6, whose dad was actually a part of the 100 Bomb Group. Um, check out his channel. He's worked, his father was a part of the 100 Bomb Group, and he's done plenty of streams about his dad's uh, wartime service. But, but yeah, definitely should be a great show, um, for sure. It is beautiful out here today. Absolutely beautiful. And thanks for the link. Um, that's the link of the 100 bomb group. Yeah, this part of Cuba, very, very nice. So we're about 56 nautical miles from our destination here in Barracoa. So. Yeah, an absolutely beautiful flight here today. Beautiful, beautiful flight today. Well, next, uh, our next stream, which is going to be on Sunday, we'll be doing a two-part stream on Sunday. So we'll be back in Barakoa, um, again. But we're going to be doing the first part of the flight will be from Barakoa all the way to Montego Bay in the ATR. Then. Our second flight will take a smaller general aviation plane, probably an X Cub or something. Like either take the X Cub or take, yeah, take the X Cub. We'll be flying through um, all this part of Jamaica 
and make our way over to Kingston and, and land at um, Norman Mainly International to conclude on um, that flight. So yeah, it's going to be both be airliners and general aviation as well for that part because Jamaica is a pretty small island. So I wanted to do something for two-parter. So, and of course on, and that would be um that would be on uh, Jamaica. We'll be learning all more about that. Yeah, the bonanzas. Not, it's been a long time. It's been a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll be giving out the schedule for next week's streams. Um, starting on. Um, I'll be giving you the streams for uh, after Sunday's stream. I'll give you the streams for next week. But I believe next week, if the world update comes out on Tuesday, we'll be actually in Jamaica again, on. On there, and we'll be doing some airline flying from Jamaica. We'll do. Uh, we'll be doing first Montego Bay. We'll make our way over to. Um, we'll be making our way from Montego Bay over to, uh, Scarborough in Trinidad and Tobago. We'll be we'll be checking out two handcrafted airports from there. So we'll. Or, or actually, we might do Montego Bay over to um, Mike Uniform Charlie Lima, play a Serena, and then from there we'll go check out Cancun. That might be the alternative plan we might do. I think that would be better. Be a little shorter. Let's go ahead and deal with the last slides of the stream. Um, let's go ahead and talk about Barcoa. Barcoa is the last city of Cuba that we will be visiting on this tour. Um, it's a Barcoa, or its full name, Nuestra Señora de la Acción de Barcoa, aka Our Lady of the Assumption of Barcoa, is a municipality and city in the Guatemala province near the eastern tip of Cuba. It was visited by Admiral. Christopher Columbus on November 27, 1492, and it was founded by the first governor of Cuba, the Spanish conquistador, Diego Velazquez de Celior, in 1511. It is the oldest Spanish settlement in Cuba and was its first capital, the basis of its nickname, Ciudad Prim Primada, the first city. Uh, it's well known for its tropical rainforest climate, with high temperatures and rainfall through the year. 
In fact, Karakoto was is located on the spot where Professor Columbus landed on his first voyage. Um, during the 16th and 17th centuries, Barco was also a haven for illegal trade with France and England. That was a popular trade location. Um, in front of the middle 19th century, Barco was where many expeditions of independence fighters landed here, um, which helped gain independence from Spain. And before the Cuban Revolution, the only access was by sea. Um, but then once, but there were a couple of roads built all over the place. But Barracola definitely is well known for its tourist areas. It, um, it's kept tourism low, but it's still ideal location. There's also some houses and museums. As well as the Fort El Castillo with the commanding view of the town. Which is now a hotel. Quite a few music venues. There's also a table mountain. Called El Unique, and it also has lots of uh, stuff for gastronomy people, including um, the local delicacies in the area. Chucurucho, which is a mix of coconut and sugar and other ingredients like orange, guava, and pineapple, wrapped in a palm leaf, as well as chocolate. Um, some notable people include Pablo Borges Delgado and Eduardo Davison, who are uh, who were artists and composers, respectively. They were born here in the city. Yeah, pretty cool stuff about Barakoa. And the last play in the last airport of Cuba is going to be Gustavo Rizzo Internet uh, Airport, which is the domestic airport serving Barakoa, located two kilometers north of the city. He receives flights from Havana on Aero Javovina. Uh, and in 2013, he had over 19,000 passengers. However, it was damaged by flooding in 2008. And it has one runway, which is about 6,000 feet, and it's not able to handle night flight. It mainly has one route to um, Havana. So well, that's it, everyone. That's all the slides for Cuba. Let's join the scenery for a little bit before we got prepared for landing. So we're going to go land on runway 34 for this landing. We're going to land at 34. So we can take a so we can take a brief look at the city uh, before we land. But yeah, guys, thank you all so much again for this flight. Um, this has been an absolutely amazing stream, guys. Been very very excited uh, to do this here with you guys. Been an absolute blast.
Jesus. This is absolutely pretty different. Like, who knew this part of Q was this nice to fly? Beautiful, beautiful flying. Um, King Trover's with us. Yeah, the location here is just pretty. Pretty.
Mm. Here's Barakoa down. Down over here is the city of Barakoa. There's El Unique, the tabletop mountain.
Well, guys, that is it, everyone. That will complete um, leg number, day number six is in the books, everyone. Um, guys, thank you all so much for being here today. And that will wrap up Cuba. So, guys, thank you all so much for being here. And I hope to see you all again on Sunday. We'll be back here at Barracoa. And we'll make our way over to Kingston tomorrow. So, guys, thank you all so much. And I hope that we see each other again. You guys make a pretty big difference here. So, we're going to go ahead and set up the raid for MSFS Official. Make sure you guys stick around for the raid. And I hope you guys have a great start to your weekend.